so I'd just like to uh, thank the organisers for the opportunity to present this work today. Uh, so the work I'm going to be talking about is basically something where we were trying to use topological features of the data to perform parameter inference in a Bayesian framework. So this is joint work uh, with my collaborators uh, Paul Kirk and Heather Harrington and the work I'm going to be talking about is uh, from this paper that we published recently in Bioinformatics where we were looking at trying to use topological features in a model of angiogenesis to perform Bayesian inference. Uh, so I have quite a few things to get through and not a huge amount of time so I'll give a quick outline which is I'm going to talk about the angiogenesis model very briefly and then introduce ABC. I'm not sure how necessary the introduction to ABC is in a conference about expensive inference and expensive systems, but um, I'll go over ABC briefly and then talk about topological data analysis and how we've applied that in the ABC framework. So to give you an introduction uh, to the model that we're using, so this is uh, really building on previous work uh, from this paper by Nardini et al where they were looking at topological data analysis for angiogenesis. So we're using something called the Anderson-Chaplin model of angiogenesis that models the growth of blood vessels towards a tumour as they're following um, different gradients uh, as they migrate across uh, towards the tumour. So the growth of the blood vessels depends on two different things. It depends on tumour tumor angiogenic factors, or TAF, and also on fibronectin. So we have assumed we kind of have a linear uh, distribution of tumor angiogenesis factor increasing along the x-axis and fibronectin increasing, uh, decreasing, sorry, along the x-axis. So uh, the blood vessels tend to migrate up the gradient of TAF by chemotaxis and up the gradient of fibro fibronectin by haptotaxis. So then the model is simulated on a 2D lattice, so a 2D grid that you can see uh, one of the simulations here is just a set of pixels on a 2D grid. And it's modelling you know, the way the blood vessels are growing as they move across the uh, 2D grid, doing things like dividing, branching off, uh, perhaps joining together again as they move across and grow. So in the model, we focused on two particular parameters, uh, chi and rho, that are the coefficients for chemotaxis and haptotaxis. So actually, um, in this previous work, they found by simulating data from a wide range of parameter values that there were kind of different regimes in the parameter space. So for certain parameter values, uh, perhaps where one of these chemotaxis or haptotaxis dominated over the other, you'd observe quite different kinds of behaviour. Um, but what they didn't look at was how to actually infer the parameters of the model given some observed data. So what we're trying to do is the kind of inverse problem of going s from some observed data like this to inferring a posterior on the model parameters. So uh, we've applied Bayesian inference. Um, obviously that's nice because it allows us to work with mechanistic models like this Anderson-Chaplin model and it gives us an idea of the uncertainty in the parameter estimates. So we'll see when we look at the results that actually perhaps some of the parameters aren't identifiable um, and it also allows us to draw predictive samples so we can check whether our inferred posterior is actually realistic or not. Uh, so in Bayesian inference our task is to try and learn uh, the posterior distribution of the model parameters given the observed data and that depends on several terms, uh, one of which is the likelihood of the model, p of y given theta. And one of the things we often encounter in biology, so modelling these kinds of biological systems, is that it's quite tricky to evaluate the likelihood uh, for these kind of models and in particular for this Anderson-Chaplin model of angiogenesis. Uh, so as we saw in the previous talk, when we can't evaluate the likelihood, we can turn to something called approximate Bayesian computation. Uh, so to give you a kind of intuition of what this is all about, basically the idea is to, to kind of assess the plausibility of a particular parameter value. We simulate data from that parameter value and then compare its properties to some observed data. And that then gives us an idea of whether that parameter value is kind of feasible in terms of generating some simulated data that's similar to the observed data. So uh, we can write this down just um, as taking the integral over lots of simulations and perhaps uh, requiring that the simulated data is exactly the same as the observed data. But obviously, 
if we were to try and approximate this integral using Monte Carlo integration, then that's not going to work terribly well if we're doing simulations and trying to test for exact equality between the observed and the simulated data. So in practice, people tend to use a kernel. Uh, so we could use a uniform kernel at a fixed distance, perhaps a cutoff epsilon, and just check whether the simulated data is within some distance epsilon of the observed data and take a Monte Carlo estimate of this integral to approximate the uh, likelihood. So in this slide, I've talked about uh, taking distances between the observed data and the simulated data. But actually, in practice, generally what we do is use summary statistics of the data. Uh, so <laughs> a very simple example of this would be uh, not saying that this is a sensible thing to do, but for a normal distribution, if you're trying to estimate the mean, you could take the mean of a sample simulated from a normal distribution with a certain parameter value and compare that to the mean of the observed data. And that would give you an estimate of the uh, mean of your normal distribution. So there is actually uh, some pitfalls here. So it does require some care in terms of choosing your summary statistics. So for the estimating the mean of a normal distribution, if for our summary statistic uh, we use the median or the minimum or the maximum, that's not actually sufficient um, for the mean of a normal distribution. So actually our inference would be biased and not actually give us a something that converges to the tree posterior. So uh, there's a very nice paper about this by Christian Robert about uh, lack of confidence in approximate Bayesian computation, specifically for model selection, but it's also a problem uh, in the case where you're trying to perform parameter inference. So quite often uh, people use kind of domain specific summaries based on their expertise. It's very difficult in general to determine what counts as a sufficient statistic for a particular model, especially when we're working with these biological models that can be quite complex. Uh, so to give you a summary of what, how we've used ABC in this work, we've just used the most basic kind of ABC, uh, the rejection sampler. So we generate uh, N samples from the prior, so perhaps 10,000 samples. And then for each of those samples, we simulate data. So this is an example of uh, a random walk simulation. And we do that for all 10,000 parameter values we've drawn from the prior. And then for each of those, we summarize them somehow. So we summarize them using the summary statistics we've decided to apply and then select uh, the summary statistics that are within a certain distance of the summary of the observed data. Uh, so we've used the Euclidean distance and then you can just select the uh, simulated data points that are close enough to the observed data and then go through to your, I'm not sure you can see on this slide, but actually these ones are colored in a different color. So you're selecting the samples from the prior, which corresponded to the simulated data that was close to the observed data. Uh, so it gives you a sample or approximate sample from the ABC posterior. So the thing that we need to think about here is how do we select the summary statistics for our model of angiogenesis? So we're assuming we can simulate from it, but we need to have some way of summarizing the data. Uh, so people have looked at this in the past, doing various different approaches to uh, summarizing the data, perhaps even just doing visual inspection and looking for things that are close to the observed data, uh, using things like the number of segments in the data, the number of tips you end up with at the end and so on. Uh, so in this work, what we were interested in doing was looking at can we apply topological data analysis to use as our summary statistics in the inference uh, for the model. So topological data analysis basically um, considers the shape of the data by computing topological properties of the data. And one particular kind of topological data analysis, which is almost synonymous with topological data analysis, is something called persistent homology. Uh, so this characterizes the features of our topological space and their persistence across scales in the data. So we use homology to characterize uh, the topological features of the data. So as an example, if we have a torus, then if we're looking in dimension zero, uh, the elements of the homology groups correspond to the connected components. So for a torus, we have just one connected component. And so we have one element of the homology group in dimension zero. In dimension one, you can see we have two loops. So this loop here and this one going around here. And these two loops then mean that we have two elements of the uh, homology group in 
dimension one. And then in dimension two, if this torus is hollow, we have a void inside of the torus and one element in the homology group in dimension two. So persistent homology then tracks the changes in these um, features of the topological space as we look across scales or different, um, as we'll see in a second, filtrations of the data. So in persistent homology, we considered the birth and death of elements of these homology groups in some dimension over a filtration that we define on the data. Uh, so to give you an example of what this might look like in practice, in our particular uh, data, so as an example of what the in input data might look like, uh, if we have some data that looks like this, we can define a filtration which just sweeps from left to right across the data. So we're moving um, along the x-axis in the data and including more and more of the data as we go from left to right. And then what the persistent homology does is it actually tracks the birth and death of the elements of the homology groups in each dimension as we filter across the data. So in this example, we have one element in the uh, homology group of dimension zero, which is a single connected component that's born at time zero. And then as we sweep across, you can see at time three roughly uh, in the filtration, we have our first uh, component in dimension one, which is a loop being born. And then it continues and both of these persist as we move across to the end of the filtration. So we can summarize this using something called a persistence diagram which just uh, illustrates all of the um, hom uh, topological features and their birth and death time in the filtration. So in this example, we have one feature in dimension zero that's born at time zero and persists indefinitely to the end of the filtration, and also a loop that's born at time three and also then persists indefinitely to the end of the filtration. So to work with um, these summaries of the topological features of the data, we need to find a way of using this in our ABC framework. So uh, the persistence diagrams are a little bit tricky to work with because they're actually a multi-set of points of birth and death times. So there are actually ways, um, I'll perhaps come back to this later, of calculating distances directly between persistence diagrams. But in this work, we chose to use an approach where we actually vectorize the persistence diagram into a nice, neat vector that we can then apply uh, a distance function on in our ABC framework. Uh, so there's an approach to vectorizing persistence diagrams from this work by Adams et al, et al. Uh, called persistence images. And how these work is uh, quite simple to get your head around. It's basically taking each of the points on the persistence diagram and uh, centering a kernel around each of those points. So in this work, we used a Gaussian kernel with a fixed bandwidth. And so you go from having your persistence diagram to a surface which you can discretize onto a grid where you have uh, centered around each point on the persistence diagram a Gaussian kernel um, and in these, you actually use the persistence of the feature rather than the death time. So we use uh, the birth on the x-axis and then the amount of time that fi feature persists for on the y-axis. So then you can vectorize these by just um, concatenating the columns or rows to give you a nice simple 2D vector we can work with in the ABC framework. So actually, um, in this previous work, it was shown that just using a left to right filtration alone doesn't work particularly well. And actually um, in that work, I think they combined left to right and right to left filtrations and showed that that worked uh, quite a bit better. The problem with the left to right filtration is that as we saw on one of the previous slides, uh, some of the features just persist indefinitely towards the, to the end of the filtration. And that means that things like the size of the loops, we don't have any information on how long they persist for, only their location in the data. So we're missing some of the information about the topological features of the data. So actually what we did was to take something called the extended persistence, which considers a relative homology with respect to the super level sets, as well as looking at the sub level sets in the data. So you can think of this as going from the uh, left to right sweep through the sub-level sets to then considering as well the relative homology with respect to the super-level sets. So the nice thing about this is that that means that all of the features have a finite persistence and we can also capture the size of the loops. So 
uh, for example, where we have this loop that's born at time three in the filtration, in the extended persistence, that loop then persists until a uh, homo homological feature is born in the uh, super level sets, and so it would die at time one in this uh, stage of the filtration. So really what this does is it allows us to capture information about the size of the loops as well in the filtration and include that in our features that we're using to summarize the data. So to give you an outline of how this all works, we have our ABC framework where we sample parameters from the prior and simulate the data on our 2D grid. So the data that we're working with are just the images at the final time step of the simulation. So this runs over multiple time steps, but we're just looking at the final step and calculating then the persistent homology and summarizing that as a persistence image. So then we take our observed data and also uh, calculate the persistent homology, summarize that, and then compare distances between the simulated data and the observed data, apply a cutoff, and that then gives us our ABC posterior. Uh, so these persistence images, <laughs> unfortunately, aren't particularly interesting ones. I just chose the ones that I could get my hands on. Um, they do sometimes look a bit more interesting than this. These ones aren't uh, particularly informative, and these, these don't actually correspond to these images. I could only find um, these four, so they're not actually accurate, so don't read too much into these. So looking at the results of uh, what we get when we apply this to some simulated data, we generated 100 parameter values sampled randomly from the prior, and then performed a posterior inference using ABC. So you can see we have, um, for our observed data, taking ABC posterior projective uh, samples from the posterior by just picking parameter values from the posterior and simulating data with those parameters, you can see the predictive samples actually correspond quite nicely to the behavior we observe in the real data or the, the simulated data we're basing our inference on. So you can see, for example, there's kind of different regimes you can see appearing, um, different kind of classes of behavior. And these actually correspond quite nicely to the different classes of behavior that were seen in the previous work uh, I've been talking about. So actually, uh, in the parameter space, you can see looking at, uh, I don't know if you can read that, but we have two parameters, uh, chi and rho. So chi is the parameter determining the degree of chemotaxis, and rho is determining the degree of haptotaxis. So actually where the um, migration of the blood vessels is dominated by chemotaxis, you can kind of see they just very quickly head over towards the tumor cells, which are on the right-hand side here. Um, they're fairly straight, and we don't see too much um, in terms of kind of uh, loops and clusters and clumps of uh, blood vessels and things. So actually where we have a kind of balance between the two, between haptotaxis and chemotaxis, so roughly along... Um, this straight line here, you can see we get these kind of clumps forming where there's a kind of balance between being drawn to the right and also being drawn back towards the left by um, haptotaxis. And then finally, when the migration is driven by haptotaxis, so rho is much larger than chi, we can see they kind of end up just stuck over on the left here. Uh, so these kind of regions in the parameter space where we have these kind of um, ridges where the parameter is not really identifiable correspond very nicely to the re regimes in the parameter space that were found in the previous work by just sampling lots of parameter values and then clustering the observed data based on their features. Uh, so just to double check this, uh, we also did the same thing for 100 samples from the prior and used some very simple statistics that we came up with to compare to. So the statistics we used were just the mean x coordinate uh, the mean y coordinate, uh, the maximum x coordinate, and the total number of pixels. So treating this as a 2D image, um, which is a binary image, so each point is either on or off, just taking the fraction of occupied pixels. We compared the posteriors we learnt using those summary statistics with the topological ones. And we found, uh, you can see that the mean root sum of squared errors using these simple statistics is higher than using the topological ones. And also the mean entropy for the topological statistics is lower. So that means the uh, posterior is kind of more tightly focused around the true parameter values. So to summarize, um, 
We've shown that you can use these topological summaries to perform approximate Bayesian computation and do parameter inference. And the nice thing about using topological approximate Bayesian computation using TDA in this is that we can actually then naturally expand this to higher dimensions. So for example, if we had a three-dimensional model of angiogenesis, we could equally well apply this in three dimensions or even higher dimensions if we had other types of models. The other nice thing about this is that it's applicable also to other types of data. So we could perform inference on models of networks, for example, and use uh, topological data analysis and persistent homology on the network to learn parameters of a model for a particular network. So there are a couple of tricky things here. So we haven't really kind of solved um, all of the problems that you might encounter. So obviously the choice of filtration is very important in not only in this work, but also in any kind of topological data analysis. So how do you decide, you know, are you going to use the left to right filtration? Uh, there are lots of other types of filtration uh, you could use. Um, for point clouds, for example, people use very different types of filtrations where you actually expand a ball around each data point um, rather than taking a left to right, right sweeping filtration and so on. The other question is how do you actually calculate the distances between these persistence diagrams? So in this approach, we've kind of summarized them as vectors using persistence images, but there are actually approaches to directly calculating a distance between persistence diagrams. Uh, so there are things like the uh, bottleneck distance you can compute. So we did some very brief experiments and found the bottleneck distance actually didn't work as well. And I think that is because uh, you lose some of the information when you're calculating distances directly between the diagrams using bottleneck distance because you actually you lose some of the inf information about um, perhaps the multiplicity of the points on the persistence diagram. Uh, so obviously this work also would then be adaptable to more uh, sophisticated uh, Monte Carlo samplers, so we could use things like ABC, SMC to deal with higher dimensional parameter spaces. Uh, doing ABC rejection sampling on a higher dimensional parameter space would be a terrible idea. Uh, we just used the rejection sampler because we had a, this model with two parameters and it was kind of the simplest thing to implement. But obviously you could use any of the existing work in the literature on ABC to do this in higher dimensions. Uh, so we're now looking at using ABC SMC samplers to perform parameter inference for more uh, parameters of these models and also different types of models as well. Uh, so I'd just like to finish by acknowledging uh, my collaborators, so Heather Harrington and the Algebraic Systems Biology Group at Oxford, and also Paul Kirk at the MRC Biostatistics Unit and uh, some of my students at the University of Surrey. Uh, so thank you all for listening. Thanks, Tom. Um, does anyone have any questions? Hi. Um, in this uh, in vitro exper well, in vivo, sorry, uh, in silico experiments that you have done, um, you assume that you you can observe the whole antigenesis process into the at all time points. I wonder if you. Uh, say that you only observe the, um, them at uh, spe specific intervals and how would that change the posterior and mm -hmm. how would the, these, let's say, misspecification in the posterior would change in your prediction in the end? Would that even matter? Uh, so actually in this work, we only use the final results of the simulation for the uh, topological data analysis. So it's only the, um, I don't know if I can go back to my slides now. <laughs> Um, so it's only it's only the final simulated image on the TD grid. So you could look at, um, for example, over several time steps as these um, blood vessels are growing from left to right. You could look at statistics as they're moving across, but actually we only looked at the final um, image at the end. So I think it would probably. Um, actually, I don't know, for the topological statistics, I'm not sure it would make much difference because effectively all you would be getting would be a time series of how it ends up in this final state. But I don't know that that would be that informative um, because the topological features are all captured in the final state of it anyway and the left to right filtration kind of mimics 
how it's growing from left to right anyway. I think with other statistics, so other ones that people have typically used in the literature, it is actually useful to have all of the time points and that might actually be quite crucial. But one of the nice things about what we've done is that you don't need to observe all the time points. Um, thank you for your great talk, really interesting. I uh, had no idea that you could do these things, but uh, anyway, I, I was wondering, oh, actually I'm quite surprised that the topological information is enough for parameter inference, or at least that was my intu intuition. I was wondering whether you have uh, a sense of, of how important the actual density of, of the blood vessels is, so you get these crossings for the topological features, and also how important the boundaries of the growth. So it seems like now you're initializing everything on the left, uh, from my perspective, and everything grows to the right. So, so how important are these um, circumstances for the information content of the topological features? Yes, um, so uh, actually looking at this one, um, I mean obviously <laughs> the fact that it's growing from left to right is very important here because if we change the filtration that was going from top to bottom, uh, that would not perform nearly as well as one that's going from left to right because actually um, some of the things that we're interested in are things like how far across um, the blood vessels actually make it. So in these ones, they only make it a very short distance. And by doing the left to right filtration, we get information about how long these connected components, for example, persist uh, as we move across from left to right and back right to left. Um, whereas if we uh, had a different kind of filtration that was going in a different direction, uh, we'd need to, obviously that wouldn't work as well. So based on the way that our model is kind of set up, that really influences a lot what, what it makes sense to use in the uh, persistent homology uh, to summarize the data. Uh, so the other question, I think, um, so we do capture things like, um, as I just mentioned, how far across the blood vessels make it just in terms of the connected components. It's difficult to get a sense for how important the different parts of the, the um, persistent homology are. So one thing I think it would be really interesting to look at actually is looking in each of the dimensions. You know, if we look at the loops alone, how does that affect the parameter inference? So that's maybe something we could look at in future work is to see you know, the relative importance of these different things. Thank you. Great, and uh, I think just in the interest of time, we've got one more question, which is from Helen Byrne online. Um, and she asks, how would you adapt your method to analyze real, i.e. biological vascular networks? Yes, uh, I think that would be quite tricky. So I think what we'd need to do would be to find a way of effectively turning the real images into something that looks a bit like this. So discretizing them onto a grid and then you know identifying which uh, pixels on that grid correspond to blood vessels and which don't, so we can turn it into a nice binary image. I think just doing that alone would be quite a complex thing to do. So there's a lot of variables involved in just doing that. And then also, I think you would need to think about, in terms of the scale, um, so is the scale of the, the images you're looking at, you know, um, are they all taken on the same scale? Are the ones that are more zoomed out or zoomed in than others? I think working with actual real biological data, this would be much more complex. And we've simulate, simplified it a great deal by using simulations here. Um, so that's, that's something I think would take quite a bit of work, but it, I think it should be possible, but it would be quite tricky. Great, thanks Tom. And if anyone, everyone could uh, join me in thanking both of our speakers for this morning's session.